Um, so what I want to talk to you about this morning, uh, I'm going to really canter through this in 15 minutes, is uh, some research that we commissioned back in 2010 as part of a much wider program of research at the Arts Council to try and understand digital engagement in arts and culture. So I'm not going to dive into the details uh, in uh, too much this morning, but what I, what I hope to do is to kind of convey some of the kind of key messages that the research generated. Uh, and I also want to talk a little bit about digital engagement with arts and culture from a kind of strategic policy maker's perspective. So who are Arts Council? Well, um, we are the National Development Agency for Arts and Museums and Libraries. We inherited those arenas of policy development from the MLA last year. Um, we have a mission which is achieving great art for everyone and that's uh, conceptualised through a strategic framework, just like HLF we have our own, and ours is a 10-year strategy with five goals, and those cover um, excellence, engagement, um, skills and diversity, <coughs> children and young people. I can't remember if I've got all five there, that's terrible isn't it? Um, <laughs> And, uh, anyway, you can look that up. <laughs> and um, how we achieve those four or five strategic goals are um, through three mechanisms, mechanisms. Through investment, the Arts Council uh, distributes um, over the current spending period from about 2012 to 2015 uh, about £1.4 billion of taxpayers' money and about £1 billion of lottery money. We also do this through development. So activities such as providing research support um, and skills development and other interventions like that. And also advocacy, so we kind of champion the role that the arts can play in society and the way that they can make a difference to people's lives. And within the Arts Council there's a small research team, of which I'm a member, and we are charged with trying to bring as much evidence and research to bear on policy development at the Arts Council. So what about this piece of research I'm going to talk about? Well, um, it was part of a more wider bit of digital research that we undertook. And those really had two main aspects. One was a content snapshot that we did of websites and online presence of funded organisations that we fund. The other was to look at more about public engagement and what the audience, potential audience, existing audience and online population um, what their engagement with arts and culture online was. And I'll get into that in a second. But I think one of the things to say right at the start of these two days is that um, digital presents a real complex set of questions for a national policy maker. And this is true whether it's in archaeology, heritage, museums, arts, libraries, any arena at all. Which is, when we talk about digital, are we talking about the actual content, the creation of that content? Um, and uh, is that a model where you have a, a creator and then an audience, or is it a kind of collaborative process? Are we talking about digital as an engagement strategy? And that can simply be sort of dissemination outwards, or again, some kind of more interactive process. And both as a researcher and as a policy maker, digital is incredibly fast moving, which um, makes things incredibly difficult to conceptualize and to measure over time. You know, digital is, is fickle, it's faddish, and it's incredibly difficult to find comprehensive metrics for that. And you'll see as we go through that this research was undertaken in 2010, and it kind of already starts to feel a little bit out of date. Um, so that may be a running theme. So I've covered that. So what about this digital audiences research? I should say that all of this is available online for free. Um, and not just the particular research report that I'll be talking about, but the whole program as well. As well as a whole other range of resources uh, that we've produced in the research team at the Arts Council. So what I really want to talk to you about is this report, which we commissioned from MTM London, as part of this digital research, and the title is Digital Audiences Engagement with Arts and Culture Online. This was a research project that we co-commissioned with 
Museums, Libraries and Archives Council back in 2010, and Arts and Business. And it was a specific piece of research that was a quantitative research exercise that was an online survey, so a survey of an online population. And what it wanted to do was to try and understand, of that online population, who, who amongst them engage in, in culture, which includes libraries, museums and the arts, and of those that do engage, are there any kind of patterns um, to, uh, and kind of commonalities to their behaviour online, their attitude to arts and culture online? And does that, are those patterns also there in people that don't engage? So are there, are there patterns in people's drivers to engage as well as patterns in people's barriers as to why they don't engage? So this is the kind of the key thing to dwell on, and the sort of one message to take home really, is that of the online population, so it's a nationally representative sample of the online population uh, resident in England, of that online population, about half have used to engage in arts and culture. So not a, not a, major, not a huge majority by a long way, but that online engagement in arts and culture is really strong amongst younger generation, as you might expect. And that mobile was uh, increasingly important, and actually subsequent research to this has proved that mobile is absolutely kind of critical, and really kind of where um, engagement strategies and digital should really be concentrating um, at the moment, to kind of reflect the way in which people's um, digital habits are changing over time. So as part of this survey, this online survey, we asked about people's behaviours and their attitudes as to what they do online. And this backs up other research that we've done through mechanisms such as the Taking Part Survey and other forms of research that really, of those people that do engage online, the majority is to kind of find out more information about a analogue engagement with arts and culture that they're going to to participate in. <coughs> Digital is also a really important um, mechanism by which people can undergo the bureaucracy associated with an engagement in uh, some kind of cultural form. And um, looking at previews, uh, purchasing tickets, finding out destination information, that kind of thing is obviously important. Much fewer people have actually tend to kind of have a creative encounter with arts and culture online in terms of generating their own content or responding in a creative way to some existing cultural content. Two of the kind of conceptual models which I kind of want to leave you with um, this morning is in thinking about this kind of ordering, a kind of a hierarchy of sorts of digital engagement with arts and culture, and that you have this kind of large biomass of people at the bottom who predominantly use it for some kind of ease of access to a more analogue encounter with arts and culture, and then increasingly fewer people <coughs> um, undertaking that more sophisticated and detailed uh, engagement, where they're actually engaged in the creative process themselves. So if you can cast your minds back to 2010, um, social networking included MySpace and Bebo. Um, and Twitter wasn't quite such a kind of widely adopted social networking tool amongst the kind of professional class of those in certain age brackets as it is these days. So it's when looking at these sorts of stats, it's important to bear that in mind and just remember the rapidity of change that, that's happened over the last few years. So you, what you can see there though is that, um, again this replicates the previous slide, namely that um, some of the more uh, frequent types of digital engagement tend to be um, sort of, uh, they tend to be kind of um, short-lived, easy to do, quite straightforward um, 
uh, digital activity rather than anything so in depth. What it also tells you there is that residual large number of people on the right, so the blue element of this slide, are people that don't engage. And the kind of non-engagers, where they're non-engaging in culture, non-engager online, um, Aretha mentioned something associated with the sort of digital divide and the demographics associated with digital engagers of various kinds. I think that's really important to bear in mind here. And it's true of every kind of domain within digital engagement. So your social networking strategy, there are going to be people who engage online but not going to be doing it for social networking uh, mechanisms. Uh, there are going to be people who are going to like particular types of content or not. But how do you make sense of all of these kind of various ways in which people engage or don't engage online? One of the really useful tools to think about um, engagement of a population with a particular phenomena is through segmentation. So segmentation is basically a way of understanding the common characteristics amongst the population but without prejudicing what those common characteristics are. So there are patterns in people's behavior. You might like to think you're unique. You're not. You're incredibly predictable. Um, however, none of you are all the same. <coughs> you're patterned, but you're not the same. You're not unique, but there are patterns. How do we understand what those patterns are? It's not that you know, all men over 65 engage in the same particular way, or all females of a particular ethnicity engage in a particular way much more sophisticated than that. And segmentation allows you to generate data and then order it in such a way that you can see those patterns that are not um, constrained by our traditional understandings of demographic variables and their relationship to a particular type of engagement. And so what we did with the um, online research, the one that's really the focus of what I want to talk about, is that we undertook a segmentation using the research and data generated by this online survey to try and understand the different categories of people that engage with arts and culture online. And what we found is that, so you, what you have here in the, in the pie chart is the total number of people that were in the, in the survey. Um, and that within that there were um, those that did engage, which are the ones in the boxes. And we detected basically three types of person that engages in arts and culture online. These are the leading edge, of which I would categorize probably all of you to be within. Generally, generally younger, they're practically always online through mobile devices or other mechanisms. They share a lot of links, they're kind of socially networked, all that kind of thing. The confident core, which tend to be these large number of people that do those sort of shallow um, level types of digital engagement. So they're able to navigate websites, they're able to book online, they're able to perhaps uh, update their status every now and again on Facebook or something of that sort, but they tend not to be, you know, early adopters, uh, leading edge types. And then you have the sort of the late, the late adopters, which, you know, that's in that kind of silver surfer territory. Um, they tend to be attending kind of mainstream um, events or activities. Uh, but what was interesting was that there is a coherent segmentation here. So there are patterns which we were able to detect. And segmentation is really useful because if you're engaging in some kind of marketing activity, what works for one person will not work for another. You can't communicate everything to everyone all of the time. But you need some kind of roadmap through this um, confusing mess of the diverse ways in which people engage online. I'm not going to spill on this one because I'm running out of time, but just to show you a few rather busy slides, which are the kind of pen portraits of these three segments of online engagers for uh, arts and culture. You can kind of hopefully see that for, your, for yourselves, but it's um, important to kind of recognize that these are kind of, this confident core, this kind of large number of people within the population tend to be kind of quite reliant on very familiar brands. Um, they tend to um, be engaged in some type kind of conventional activities where arts and culture is concerned. <coughs> Here we have the late adopters. <coughs> you can see it. I'll share all this um, after the conference. 
And then you have you guys. Okay. Okay, so why should any of you care about any of this? And why should the Arts Council or any other policymaker care about this? I think one of the things to recognise is the, this kind of the first bullet point here, the first point here, which is that this research and others demonstrates a really important key finding for us, which is that you don't tend to reach new audiences by generating digital content. Okay? What you tend to do is have a, a much deeper and rich engagement with people that are already engaged in the subject or the activity that you're trying to communicate or trying to get engagement for. And therefore, just making something on, available online, uh, just live streaming it, um, just creating an archive, <coughs> tends not to massively expand the number of people that you're going to reach. Which kind of brings us to the second point, is that d digital, as far as we can understand it, um, at a kind of high level, is really, in many ways, for most people, not for you early adopters, because you're all sophisticated, you know, networked individuals, but for most people, it's a kind of a networking tool, a, a marketing tool. Social media and, and mobile, I think, is something that we recognise as absolutely something that any activity needs to take account of, and organisations need to sophisticatedly kind of master what those are all about on terms which are authentic to social media, which Aretha kind of hinted at. You know, it's not about controlling the message anymore, you know, and that's quite an uncomfortable and unfamiliar place for many organisations in the heritage sector, amongst others. Segmentation tells you that you need to be kind of tailoring your approach to specific targeted audiences rather than just kind of sending out kind of communication shrapnel in all directions. And that in some ways um, technology, because it changes so rapidly and because people's expectations and people's experiences of it change so rapidly, requires um, a careful decision about the degree to which you invest both in technology both, but also in time and resources and platforms. Um, but what I want to do is, uh, before I finish, which I appreciate will be one minute, perfect, um, is kind of just give you a, um, uh, uh, a bit of a picture of other things which I think um, have happened subsequent to this research in 2010, which I think are relevant to this conference moving forward, and um, may actually be part of the program in the next couple of days, I'm not so sure. So first is um, that uh, we've been working with Culture24 um, around a project called Let's Get Real, which hopefully some of you are familiar with. If not, please do look it up um, if you're not hearing from Culture24 later on, which is a way of basically understanding how organisations can benchmark their online performance, um, make sense of that, and come together to create some workable um, online metrics, which make sense of them. I'd encourage you all to look at uh, The Space, which is a collaboration that we did with the BBC uh, this year, um, which is an online digital arts platform, and we commissioned content that was specific for that platform. And I think it's a really good opportunity to, a really good idea for you to look at it, because what, what we did there was we created a, a platform that was authentic to, to arts and culture in the digital realm rather than saying, how can we use existing infrastructure and existing platforms to distribute arts and cultural content? There's lots of interesting stuff on there. Uh, the other thing that you should keep an eye on is that uh, we have a digital R&D fund uh, that we run in collaboration with NESTA, the National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts. Uh, it's funded through the HRC. And what that does is that is funding a, a number of projects which bring <coughs> technologists together with cultural creators um, to experiment, to find out you know, what is it that the digital realm offers, both for creative practice, but also engagement strategies. And I'd encourage you to take a look at that. 
And this is me, and this is the website for my team. And um, I'd also encourage you to have a kind of look around there. There may be many things which I think are relevant um, in archaeology, uh, museums, and heritage arena, as well as um, this world of the arts from which I currently reside. So, I'm done.